Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Rebecca Baxt podcast. I'm Dr. Rebecca Baxt, board-certified dermatologist, and I'm here to discuss with you all issues relating to the skin that you're in. In this podcast, we will tackle the topic of the day quickly to get you the take-home points that you need. After listening to an episode, you should be educated about the topic and able to fix the issue yourself or well prepared to ask the right questions at your next dermatology appointment. Let's get started. I have a very special, special guest, my mother, Dr. Seda Baxt, board certified dermatologist since retired, and she is going to talk to us about her life and her career. Welcome, mom. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you agreed to do this interview. I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Can you talk to us a little bit about, I know you were born in New Jersey, but you really grew up in Staten Island. Can you talk a little bit about your upbringing and when you think that you remember that you knew that you wanted to be a doctor? Oh, it goes way back, I think. Uh, I was a very sickly child. So I was very early diagnosed with all sorts of allergies. And I went to a female physician, which was very rare at that time. And she used to give me injections and I would go every other week. So it became part of my life. And she was very fond of me and I was very fond of her. And I think it made the very good impression that doctors are really your friends and I wanted to become one of them. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit about growing up in Staten Island? I know you, to you and your two sisters and your parents. and Yes, we grew up um, in a different time. And we lived in a community that was four blocks of people all in the same kind of houses, but not identical. They were all different houses, but all in the same area. And the four blocks had a sort of like a club where they would meet for special events and they would have picnics and we would have um, like Halloween. If we celebrated Halloween, everyone would get together and talk about what we could do for the children going from place to place on Halloween. And it was a very connected community. Um of all different ethnicities. We all got along and it was a very nice place to grow up. And so you were a little bit of a sickly child. You had a great upbringing in Staten Island in a very nice community. It was you and your two sisters. You're the middle child. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about the family business? You worked in the family business. You went to high school. You went to Curtis High School. That was a bit of a distance. Yes. Um, there were three of us. I was the middle child. And the middle child has a very special relationship with the rest of the family because she's the one who has to keep the peace. So <laughs> I always was keeping the peace. Um all three of us were very significantly influenced by my mother, who was the head of her family. She was the oldest of six children, and she raised all the children. And so by the time she had us, she had had many children, really, because she raised all her sisters and brothers. And it was the time when she really thought it was important for women to get out there and be independent. Um, she herself was never able to achieve that and worked in my father's business. And I helped out in my father's business by being the bookkeeper. So everyone tried to do their piece to keep the family going. Um, I would say that we all ended up in professional careers because of this attitude. And we all went to high school for three years, left high school on a program that allowed you to go off to college early, which I thought was especially good for women because very often by the time women 
want to be in college and want to work, they're already also wanting to be pregnant and have children. So that's always a conflict for women. And I think the fact that I was able to go off to college early made that much less of a conflict for me. And I believe all three of you went to Bennington College. Do you want to talk a little bit about Bennington? We all went to Bennington, which is in Vermont, uh, which was an all-girls school at that time and part of the sister schools. So Bennington and Vassar, and they, they were all sister schools. And we did not specialize in the same things. My older sister was much more interested in psychology, and my younger sister was much more interested in in government. And my older sister ended up being a PhD in psychology and running a center at NYU. I ended up being a doctor at NYU. And my younger sister ended up being a lawyer at NYU. So we shared a lot of things in our lives. And in those days, everyone helped everyone else. So it was good to have a lawyer at my side and a psychologist in front of me. <laughs> the um, Let's back up for a second and talk a little bit about high school. You went to Curtis High School. I think it was a bit far away. How long yes. did it take you to get there and back? And did you guys have to dress a particular way? Well, we, no, we had to dress a particular way though in public school. We yes, had it to hurt us exactly at, in public school, in grade school. Oh, grade school. Okay. Grade school. We had to dress in a particular way. We had to wear a skirt, and we had to wear a handkerchief pinned to our clothing. And um, I walked home for lunch, which was a two-mile walk, and I walked to school, which was a two-mile walk. And then back. So I walked four or five miles a day just going and going and coming from school when I was in grade school. In high school, I had to take two buses and I lived up high on a hill. So I had to take this bus. I had to walk all the way down the hill, get on this bus and then change buses and take another bus to get to my high school. And that was quite a commute. Uh, and when I went to high school, we could wear skirts. We were not allowed to wear pants. And I walked in high heels because we were allowed to wear high heels. But it wasn't so easy walking in high heels down these roads. So I still did it, even though my feet hurt. <laughs> And now I'm very happy I never have to wear high heels again. <laughs> oh, and then you also in high school studied cello at Juilliard famously. Yes. And how did you and tell a little bit about that story? Oh my goodness. Um I went to Juilliard, which in those days was on 242nd Street, which was the middle of Harlem by a few blocks, it was separated. So I would take the ferry into New York, and then I would take the subway. This was all carrying my cello. The ferry was a nickel, carrying my cello on the subway, and then get on um, the subway going to 242nd Street with my cello. And then I would get out, and then I would walk to Juilliard. But if I missed the train and took the wrong train, I would I sometimes would end up in the middle of Harlem. And when that happened, which didn't happen often, <laughs> thank goodness, the police would pick me up and drive me to Juilliard. <laughs> How old were you when this was happening? Uh, probably about 11 or 12 or 13. Right. So this is the 1950s. Yeah, this is the 1950s. So very interesting. Um, and then 
when you graduated high school, I think you were 16 and went off to college and then finished college also in three years. Correct. And were 19 when you entered medical school, approximately. Correct. All right. So that is just very different than how things are done these days. Um, Correct. So young. And so do you want to, we talked about your growing up, we talked about high school, grammar school. Do you want to talk a little bit about college, getting to college? I believe you were on some type of scholarship there. You worked when you were there, what your majors were, how you enjoyed college. I always worked so that I could make some money to add to what I needed to go to college. And also so that I had some money myself that I could use on occasion. I worked in a fruit fly laboratory. I worked for my parents uh, as a bookkeeper. I also took courses so that I would not have missed certain courses. And when I went off to medical school, I still had some courses that I missed, but I made them up on breaks so that I would take special courses to enhance whatever I had lost by leaving early. And you also worked in the dining hall at Bennington, yes? At Bennington, I was head of the dining room. I created the schedules for all the other um, students who worked in the dining hall. And I ran the dining hall and I was in charge of feeding the professors. So I, I was always all around the dining, the dining hall. And that was a very significant job. I forgot how much I got paid for it, but I did get paid for that. You were in cooking. You were sort of in administration. Administration, yes. No, I wish I were cooking. I love to cook. <laughs> Oh, so what did you major in at Bennington? At Bennington, I majored in psychology and science. I had a split major and I did not love psychology at Bennington because it was all about training, doing training of people to think about things a different way. And I like to think about things in a more open, with a more open mind. So I didn't do so great in psychology (laughs) in Pennington, but I did very well in science. And I loved organic uh, chemistry because that's like cooking. And I did very well in organic chemistry. And I also uh, did my cello, which I played in the, um, in a quartet and we played music. And I loved that. And I also danced. I was um, a a modern dancer. So I had taken dance at Juilliard. So I went right into modern dance at Bennington. And that was also something I loved. Uh, So I was very spread out. (laughs) But you enjoyed Bennington. I enjoyed Bennington, yes. And I feel that you also enjoyed your upbringing and your high school, and it was all a very positive experience for you. Yes. For me, the right, being a woman in all those places was not problematic. It didn't get to be problematic until I went off to medical school. That is such a good segue. Thank you. And you can take it from there. Let's talk about applying to medical school. If you can remember, if you can't, then just go straight on to medical school at NYU. I went into medical school at NYU. Um, I was one of maybe 10 or 12 women in the class. And the men in the class looked down at us. Um, So... There was never a camaraderie uh, for the women in medical school because the women didn't want to be separated from the men. They wanted to be included. And so they didn't want to sit together. They wanted to spread out. But if we spread out, the the boys didn't pay any attention to us anyway. (laughs) So 
it was already a conflict about being a woman in medical school. And then we went to anatomy. And if you were in anatomy, the men that you worked with were always disdainful of your ability to dissect the cadavers. So there was a lot of um, difficulty being a woman in medical school. You were not treated as an equal. And when I finished medical school and I applied to go into residency, uh, I wanted to stay at NYU. And in, well, I, I first went into pediatrics, but when I went into pediatrics, which was at Kings County Hospital, uh, I was straight pediatrics. I ran the first intensive care unit in the country. And I was very excited about possibly going into academic medicine. But when I ran that unit, it, they also hired a new director of the whole um, teaching program, and they bypassed uh, one of my professors who had discovered sickle cell anemia, and they brought in someone over her. And I decided with that, I wasn't going to go into academic medicine. There was too much politics still against women. So I went into dermatology, which I adored because you could see what you were doing. You didn't even have to ask your patients how they were doing because all you had to do was look and see their rash. So I liked being in dermatology. And again, when I applied um, for a residency in dermatology, the doctor who was heading the residency said to me, I'm sorry, I'm not accepting any women this year because they all got pregnant on, on their residencies and that makes it impossible for us. So it shows you that the whole concept of women in medicine had really not changed by the time I was out in practice. Yeah. So this is now, you know, medical school, I think you guys were class of 66. Correct. And so residency, you were sort of finishing up in the late 60s, early 1970s. And I mean, these are things that, you know, people are, it's illegal to talk about these types of things today in interviews, you know, for stuff like that. But there was just a lot of sexism, basically, and discrimination against women that you and your compatriots had to fight against. And it's very educational for us, the people who came afterwards, that we benefited from your trailblazing um, as you benefited from, you know, like you mentioned, your doctor when you were a kid was a woman. And it really shows you that it's very helpful to have other people ahead of you who either look like you or are like you. And it's nice to have mentors and very difficult to fight against in this case, the patriarchy. Right. Um, but it, you know, it's not only the patriarchy. I mean, we could go on and on about this in, in many different fields, many different veins, right. many different fields and many different veins. Right. But you had a lot of sexism and discrimination against you and you fought it all the way. And it did determine a little bit what you did because you might have wanted to go into academic pediatrics, like you said, but um you decided to go into dermatology, which is very fortunate for all of us because you were such a great dermatologist. Um, is there anything else that we should talk about before we go into dermatology residency? Um, do you want to talk about meeting dad in medical school before we move on on the timeline? Your father was a free thinker. And in medical school, when we had to go to the library, we had to dress. You couldn't go in jeans or anything like that. You had to dress. So for me, I had to put on a skirt and a blouse and carry a pocketbook and wear shoes. Well, your father 
didn't wear socks with his shoes. <laughs> so I knew that he was a free thinker. And one night while I was studying like crazy, because I tried to do the best I could in medical school, it was a challenge. Um, your father came into the dorm where I lived, which was right next to the nursing student's dorm, looking for dates for a party. And I saw him there and I put my hands over his eyes and I said, guess who? And of course, he couldn't guess who it was because he had no idea who I was. And so I took off my hands and he said, oh, you put your clothes on, go upstairs, get dressed. I'll take you to a party. <laughs> and that's how we first went out together, really. It was a blind date. However, <laughs> after our blind date, he gave me his ring from that he had saved from the Wheaties box, which was like an Amer oh, and I don't think the Wheaties box from being on an airplane. It had American Airlines on it, and he gave it to me, and I wore it on my finger. So we were engaged on our first date. Right, which is a, another crazy, a crazy story, but great to hear it. And again, the rest is history, but that is the truth of the story. Um, okay, thank you for telling us that story. I wanted to go back one more, um, tell one more story that I, I recall hearing about, um, because it also shows the changes in medicine. I remember hearing when you were doing your internship in pediatrics, about the needles and basically the needles that were being used back then had to be sterilized. They were dull. And dad bought you a present of, you know, new disposable hypodermic needles. Can you tell us a little bit about working in those conditions? This is true. Uh, when I was in pediatrics, you, you rotate through various parts of the pediatric service. And the first uh, rotation was through the diarrhea ward. So the children would come in, they had had diarrhea for a week or two, and they were dehydrated, which means it was hard to find a vein because they were so dehydrated. And what you had to work with were these terribly dull um, needles from the hospital, which you had to take a flying, leaping start to get it into the skin of these tiny little babies. And it was very hard. You ended up doing what were, were open, finding a vessel and putting a catheter into a vessel and sewing it in. That was a big procedure to do just to get the baby's fluid. So your father went out and bought me all these special butterfly needles. And I was able to start IVs on all these children without having to put them through that terrible mess. <laughs> so it was a great present. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. So we are going on to um, dermatology residency, which you also you stayed at Kings County, Brooklyn, um, which was a great place to train for dermatology still is. Can you talk about dermatology residency? Dermatology residency, well, I shared, um, there were two of us that were dermatology residents, and we would do rounds uh, on all the other floors where they needed an opinion on patients that had rashes. So they would call us, and we would go into the wards, and we would tell them what to do, and we would, you know, they would ask us our opinion. And it was a, a very good way of learning about dermatology. We also saw outpatients in our clinics and um, treated them and would see them on a weekly or monthly basis and get them the care that they needed for their rashes. Um, as I, I think I said before, the one great thing about dermatology is you can see what you're doing. They have a rash. They don't even have to tell you. You can see it. You don't need much of their history, although the histories are often good to figure out why they're in such a mess. And 
one of the things that um, you got to learn is sometimes people created their own problems. I had a nurse once who had been to see all sorts of dermatologists and she came to the clinic and she was just a mess. And all she had was poison ivy, but she kept on going into a hot tub and scrubbing her poison ivy. So she never was getting better because she just wouldn't leave her poison ivy alone so that it could heal. So it oh gave you a real perspective on what people do when they don't really understand about their medical conditions. That's very true. Do you remember getting board certified in dermatology, what that process was like back then? Again, now we're talking about really sort of like maybe 1970, 71. I had to fly to Michigan. It was a very anxiety producing process. They presented you with patients and they grilled you on how you would evaluate the patient and treat the patient. And then you had to read slides, biopsies of patient's skin. And then you had to read cultures of patient's funguses and which fungus did it represent. And then you had to answer sophisticated questions on continued therapies. It was very anxiety producing. That's all I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I did pass, but it was not an easy process. No, it still is not. (laughs) Still is not. Okay. So let's talk about early private practice. You were in private practice in dermatology. And do you remember what early private practice was like? I know we still have notes from some of the patients because we you were in practice for a long time and we can still go back to some of those paper notes they were very short just one line patient with acne a little scribble is so different than today where the notes are computerized and you want to just talk about sort of early practice okay but early practice i started in a group i was in a group at um in ridgewood new jersey uh which was three dermatologists And I was the fourth dermatologist in the group. And we shared and rotated patients. And I worked within that group for about um, two years before I decided to go out in private practice with my husband who was a plastic surgeon. He was also in a group practice, but his was a single person that he went into a partnership with. And so after two years in those groups, we combined our practices and went out into a combined private practice of dermatology and plastic surgery in the same office. We were probably the first people to do that. And can you talk about why you did it? We did it because there, first of all, we were married and we very often discussed patients together. And second of all, there was a huge amount of overlap between what was going on in dermatology and what was going on in plastic surgery. And that overlap, interestingly enough, became more and more as our practices started because it evolved uh, into more of a cosmetic entity than it was in the beginning, where it was treating diseases that overlapped. It's very interesting because it was very uh, forward thinking. And now there's a lot of combined and group practices with multi-specialties. And it's a well-known fact that there's a lot of overlap between dermatology and plastic surgery, but you guys really were trailblazers. Um, Do you want to talk about also you taught at Beth Israel for a while and teaching in New York City, which must have been the 70s and 80s? When I taught at Beth Israel, 
that's when the diagnostics of AIDS came in. And that's because the early AIDS patients presented with dermatological diseases. And that's because they got these diseases that were untreatable by our usual methods. So it was fascinating that it was dermatology that really discovered AIDS. They got warts that were untreatable and in places on their bodies, it was unheard of to get warts. They got a disease called Kaposi's sarcoma, which were blood vessels growing in areas they weren't supposed to be growing. So it was quite um, a scary time to be teaching and trying to figure out what these diseases were about. Um, but it was a very interesting time. And I taught for two or three years during that period of time. And then I was too busy developing our own practice. So I stopped teaching and just started to have our own practice since we, in the beginning, were in other people's practices. So you were the managing doctor. So not only were you a dermatologist in the group practice, but you were always the managing doctor to do all the administrative work, which you had been a bookkeeper for your parents. You had, you know, managed the dining room. So it's sort of, you know, and I always say food service is honestly very similar to dermatology. It's like a high volume of people coming in and out. You have to manage the schedules. It's a similar type of business. Um, so how was that? How was being the managing doctor? It was it was difficult because, you know, all doctors are feel that everything should be done just the way they want. And when you're managing a multi doctor practice, you have to realize that you can't all have different kinds of schedules. It has to be something that the front can handle in a more um, efficient way. So it was always about negotiating things so that people felt that they were getting what they wanted and yet being sure that we could schedule efficiently. And of course, whenever you're managing doctors, there's always one who decides never to come on time. So <laughs> that is always a problem. So a lot of scheduling, a lot of managing of different personalities and, and politics, um, staffing, et cetera. What about the old days of practice before all this electronic medical records? Everything was on paper. It was a very different time. People had paper charts. Relationships with patients were different. Yeah. Do you want to just talk about sort of like what practice was like? In a lot of ways, practice was much easier on paper. First of all, because you would write notes while you were talking to your patients, you could sit and write you know, what you decided to do for their stuff as you were talking and seeing them. Um, and you were talking to them and you were developing a relationship with them and you were telling them what they had to do and when they had to come back. And all of that created a much closer contact with your patients than you can have now. Now, doctors are forced into dividing all the patient's symptoms into categories that fit into the computer. The computer was not designed for the doctor. It was designed for itself. And therefore, the doctor had to accommodate to the computer. So it was an additional step that doctors had to take, and it takes so much of their time, and their access to the material is not a one-to-one -one relationship. They sometimes have to go into four areas on the computer to figure out what the patient is doing. So in a lot of ways, the computer did not help physicians, and the computer was forced upon medicine 
with the hope that everyone would be on the same program. They did not figure that all the doctors would have different programs and therefore the computerization of each physician was not able to be intermingled. So I think it was a government program that really did not come up to expectations. I definitely agree with you. I would say the electronic conversion um, takes time away from doctors because doing the electronic record is much more time consuming, um, requires more staffing to get it done. There's a lot of garbage material in there that really has nothing to do with it. Whereas if the doctor actually wrote the note, that's the important stuff that's down there on the piece of paper. Um, obviously, there are improvements from the electronic. The ph photography is incredible in the electronic medical record. E-prescribing, while it is a bit time-consuming at the beginning, it is very efficient for prescription refills. But I agree with you. I sometimes am explaining to patients, you know, they ask me a question. It's not so easy to find the answer. There are things in all different locations in the electronic record. You have to go in and out of multiple documents to answer a particular question, whereas when we had it on paper, you could just kind of flip through the chart very quickly and find what you needed. And now it's much more time consuming to find previous information um, than it used to be. So there's pluses and minuses. Um, and I, I agree with you. Um, do you want to talk about sort of the evolution of dermatology? What the conditions that you saw at the beginning, we talked a little bit about the AIDS epidemic, what sort of went through all the years, what sort of revolutions you saw, new things that came in, because it, while it's always been a bit cosmetic because it's, you know, on the surface and things that people can see, it was not such a cosmetic field when you went into it, or even when I went into it, like the cosmetic stuff has exploded, but do you want to talk right. about sort of the evolution of the field? What's the same? What's different? Sure. I think I'd like to talk about it with acne in mind. Because I think acne is one of the things that dermatologists have to be the most interested in because they see so much acne. They see baby acne. They see adolescent acne. They see adult acne. They see teenage acne. I mean, they see acne uh, through the whole life cycle. There are major treatments for acne, but I will say, that the one discovery of vitamin A acid, retin-A, blew open the whole treatment of how we care for acne. So that drug changed so much in what we do. It didn't change the hands-on because dermatologists all, always were cleaning the skin and uh, peeling the skin to make the acne better. But once Retin-A came into the position, the, the position of being able to do a lot of that, acne started to be something that we could treat um, more aggressively. And we started to see anti-aging of the patients who were on Retin-A therapy. And that blew open the whole area of anti-aging treatments for dermatologists. So I think that that's the best way to understand it. And then, of course, all the things that came in. Uh, treatment with lights, treatment with lasers, treatment with injections, um, treatment with hormones. All of these things started to come in to the treatment of acne which created um, a lot of cosmetic focus. So it was especially easy because your father and I had an office together to link into all of that because we saw both sides of it. Excellent. Uh, excellent. I agree. Sort of the transformation of the treatment of acne sort of goes along with the whole transformation of the field of dermatology. Can you talk about sort of what were maybe some of the favorite things that you used to treat? Um, I think acne, I know, is one of your favorite things to treat. Are there things that you like to treat? I would say acne was my favorite thing to treat. Um, I also like to treat other things. 
that are now better treated than I was able to do. Psoriasis, which was a chronic disease and had a lot to do with internal diseases such as um, sugar problems and heart disease. But now the treatments for psoriasis are so much more sophisticated than what we were able to do for psoriatic patients that it's quite amazing to see the breakthrough in psoriatic care and wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Also eczema, I feel like is also having major breakthroughs. And then from a cosmetic standpoint, can you remember back to when you started? Was there any, were you doing any kind of cosmetic treatment back then? Like maybe sclerotherapy? Did collagen, the old cow collagen, uh, you know, Zyderm, Zyplast exist back? I don't remember when those things really started, but was there any sort of straight cosmetic thing that was done back when you started in the early 1970s? I don't think um, that Cosmoderm was available yet. I'm not sure, but it was not, I don't think quite yet, but when it did become available, it was a fabulous product. Um, but then we ran into issues with mad cow disease. So there are always <laughs> things that sometimes you start with something and there are complications and you have to be willing to go to something else because whatever you were doing was, was no longer acceptable. Right. So you have to be able to go with Go with the flow, as they say. <laughs> yes, go with the flow. And there were so many advances. I mean, you saw the advance of Retin-A, like you said, which blew open acne and anti-aging. And then there's sclerotherapy for leg veins. And then there became the able be able to inject cow collagen, which needed testing to make sure people weren't allergic. And then there was human collagen. And then everything changed when it's kind of Botox became available and used for dermatologic cosmetic purposes, and then hyaluronic acid fillers, the first of which was Restylane. And I remember way back when, this is when you know I was just starting out and very part-time, but your account was the largest Restylane account in the state of New Jersey. You did a lot of Restylane fillers um, for people, and it really you know, blew open the entire cosmetic world of dermatology. Yeah. It was, it was always, there was always something exciting in dermatology and dermatologists are very, most dermatologists are very interested in trying new things. A lot of doctors are very um, influenced by doing the same thing, just the way it always has been done. But dermatologists are very open-minded about trying new things. And I think that's what has pulled the field forward also is the yeah, I agree with that. I'm not exactly sure why that is, that dermatologists are very open to trying new things. I think it's because it's a visual specialty. You see what you do. You know, when someone has a stomach ache and you treat them, you don't know if their stomach ache is better. They say, oh, it's a little better, but it still bothers me when I lie down. But when their rash is better, you see it. Yeah. You know they're telling you the truth. I would also say I agree with you. And I, I'm also thinking just off the cuff that dermatology was famous for sort of like if it's wet, dry it. If it's dry, wet it. And really only having topical steroids as anything to do for years and years. So there were many years where dermatology didn't have a lot to offer. And so I think maybe that's also historically why people were always willing to try something new. Let's see if this works better than what we had before, because what we had before didn't work well. But so now well. we have so many things that work so well for so many conditions and diseases. The dermatology it's has true. so much to offer patients. Um, and then the one thing that we didn't really mention were lasers. Lasers did not lasers really exist. Okay. When you were starting out, people were still using x-ray therapy for various things, which is still used for some skin cancers, but not much else. But then lasers came on board and lasers also blew open the entire field of dermatology. Right. And we, we were one of the first people to have a CO2 laser, which was supposed to be curative 
for warts. And that's why we bought it. But it turned out <laughs> that there's no such thing as a single treatment with a CO2 laser that's going to get rid of your warts right away. Wart treatment is very sophisticated because it has to do with the own, your own body's immune response to the virus. But the laser was a very exciting tool to be using for resurfacing the skin and for doing other things. Uh, it was used for treatment of nail fungus. So it was a very interesting item to get exposed to the use of laser in dermatology. And we did have a CO2 laser that we, after we were finished using it and moving on to more sophisticated lasers, we donated to the hospital. Yeah. And then laser hair removal. I remember you guys were some of the first in the area to take up laser hair removal. Um, and then it just goes on and on and on from there. Um, so why don't you just look back on your career and tell me what do you think were like the best parts about working? Is there anything that you miss about working now that you're retired? I miss all my patients. You know, I I really, I really loved seeing my patients. I didn't have patients that I didn't love. They were great. My patients were all great. Um, there, some are difficult, but you know, you have to work through difficult in order to get better. Mm -hmm. And um, some of my difficult patients were very trying, but I was always trying to help them. And I loved the process of dermatology. I miss it. <laughs> I know your patients miss you too. And, you know, at some point most people have to retire or want to retire, but uh, your patients ask for you every day. And <laughs> usually I try to get people to write a little note and send it to you because by the end of the day, I cannot remember which patient. Please tell Dr. Seda that I said hello. Please tell Dr. Seda uh -oh. that I send my love and my regards. And by the end of my day, that's happened, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten times. And I can't well, remember. Thank you so, so much. I, I try to get people to write notes, um, but just you have had such a big impact on all of your patients and they all love you. And wish you well. And I'm sure they will be delighted to listen to this podcast and hear how well you're doing. Yeah. And I'm thrilled that you have taken over the practice because it gives them a wonderful, fantastically trained dermatologist by the old book who knows what it is to be both a patient and a doctor and is fantastic at giving care. So I think it's a wonderful transition. And I feel very good that they're getting the best care they could. Thank you so much for those kind words. And I really, I learned from the best. I learned from you. And, you know, it's just fascinating to hear about your career and how it started and, you know, all the way through to the end. Why don't you tell us about what you're spending your time on now, what you enjoy doing now that you're retired. What are you having fun with? Okay, I'm cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I love to cook. Yes, she, my mother is a famously amazing cook. Yes, I love to cook. And I actually had a small dinner party last night. Excellent. I made all sorts of things that I have not made before because I like to make new things. And I made salmon in a miso sauce. I made um, a onion bread pudding. Wow. I made a salad, which was great with all sorts of chopped up vegetables in it. And I made a dessert, which is made from maple syrup and cream and biscuits. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry I was not invited to this dinner party. That sounds delicious. So you're doing a lot of cooking. I know at some point in the pandemic, you were working on homemade yogurt and breads. Oh, yes. Yes. But this is the first time I was able to do a real cooking party for four people because of the COVID issues. And I am in my garden Although I will tell you, it has been a challenge with the weather changing all the time. But I have in my garden already growing garlic from last year. 
I have all my onions are in and they're growing already. And I just am starting to put in seeds because it was too cold. We had too many frosts. Now it's too wet, but I have put in pea seeds and lettuce seeds are coming. So I'm getting there. (laughs) And I know you always grow carrots. You always grow string beans and peppers and usually pumpkins. Yeah, all of it. Tomatoes. I grew corn last year for the first time. Corn, tomatoes. You guys usually plant some sunflowers also. Have some Sunflowers are in already. All righty. Um, and then you are busy with your dog. Yes. My your dog is doing well. Maddie is good. Yes. She's Maddie is a poodle. Yes. She she runs the family. She tells us when it's time to feed her. I've had dogs through most of our adult years here. And she at least doesn't put her teeth on my dresses, which my last dog used to do. Take me to the food thin by pulling on my clothing. But (laughs) she does stand in front of me and give me sad eyes if it's time for her food and I haven't fed her. I see. And also, I believe you've been biking. Yes, we bicycle. We have recumbent bikes that we both go out on and we take bike trips. Your father and I take bike trips together. And we just were down in Washington, which I have not seen in 10 years. And it is so overgrown. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Everything is, it's like a totally different city. It's just nuts. I, I wouldn't recognize it. And we took a bike ride. We were supposed to ride from the city to Mount Vernon. There's a bike ride you can take. But we didn't get to Mount Vernon because <laughs> it it's marked and it's not marked. And so we got a little lost, but we ended up seeing a lot of Washington and not seeing Mount Vernon at all. All righty. You've been having fun on your bike. Yes. Um, what else? I know you spend time with family and friends. And I don't know. I think, you know, you just turned 80. I did. Happy birthday. I did. Thank you. So that is amazing. And, you know, yes, I'm just really glad you did this interview. And I think your patients and the general public were really enjoy hearing about your life and career in medicine and that you're doing well and happily retired and you miss your patients and they miss you too. And that's it. Anything else you want to talk about or or say? No, I think that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was fantastic. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today on the Dr. Rebecca Bax podcast. I'm Dr. Rebecca Baxt, board-certified dermatologist. I hope this episode was informative and that you enjoyed listening. If you found this podcast useful, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It helps others find us so we can help them too. Just a caveat to remember, this is not medical advice, and please see your dermatologist or doctor for questions pertaining to your specific situation. I look forward to talking with you again in the next episode.